Remember that ultra viral video called Kony 2012 about the Ugandan warlord who recruited child soldiers, told through the eyes of some dudes from San Diego? And after raking in tens of millions of dollars, the founder of the group behind the video, Invisible Children, drunkenly admitted to stealing money from donors? Then the narrator of the video was caught naked on the street corner in a very public meltdown? Wow, that was really crazy. But even crazier than all of that is that the Obama administration used Kony 2012's viral video as marketing to ramp up its military actions in Uganda. You know, as President Obama said, upon signing the uh, Lord's Resistance uh, Army Disarmament and Northern Uganda Recovery Act last October, we, quote, congratulate the hundreds of thousands of Americans who have mobilized to respond to this unique crisis of conscience. And I think that this uh, viral video that you mentioned is part of that response. And today I can announce that our advisors will continue their efforts to bring this madman to justice and to save lives. It is part of our regional strategy. Our goal is helping to rid Coney to bring peace and stabilization back to this region so they can go back to their normal lives. Well, the big kicker to the story is that the Obama team rallied all of this anger and outrage at the Lord's Resistance Army for their atrocities in support of the U.S.-backed Ugandan army that was carrying out the same kinds of war crimes, including mass rape and massacres of civilians, under the command of one of the world's longest-serving dictators, American puppet General Museveni. The U.S. never cared about his atrocities, like the 2016 massacre he ordered of an entire village where his soldiers executed 15 children. Or about the fact that, like Joseph Kony, General Museveni himself came to power by, ding, 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 using child soldiers. This story is emblematic of U.S. policy in Uganda, where that top U.S. ally just massacred 54 unarmed protesters in November 2020 with bullets supplied by the Pentagon. It's a stunning story, and probably one you've never heard of, because it wasn't considered worthy of coverage in U.S. media. Fifty-four protesters mowed down by a government completely supported by Washington, and at a protest that was demanding nothing more than a democratic election. The exact framing the U.S. uses to justify coups, sanctions, and invasions all over the world. Uganda, like every other country in Africa, was carved into being by artificial colonial borders. It is home to 32 different local languages and a broad ethnic diversity. Its lush, fertile land and natural beauty earned it the title the Pearl of Africa by the British Empire, which declared Uganda its property in 1894. But revolts from peoples across the entire region against colonial rule marred the British in heavy fighting. So the British officers, commanding armies of Nubian and Sudanese soldiers they conscripted, implemented a scorched earth policy, raising villages and massacring women and children of any peoples who resisted. The policy was so brutal, it sparked a mutiny among the Nubian and Sudanese soldiers, who, when ordered to continue it, instead murdered all of their British commanders. The British had to rush an entire army regiment to Uganda just to crush the mutiny. Since scorched earth alone could not tame the new Uganda for the British crown, they implemented a different policy that echoes to the present day. Divide and conquer. With the colonial borders encompassing many ethnic groups, they heaped power and rewards on one, the Baganda peoples, and imposed their language, agriculture, and rule over other ethnic regions. According to Ugandan historian Solomon Baribi Rukuka, the Baganda became the cruel arm of the British. Sectarian conflict today, used by the U.S. Empire to justify military intervention, has its roots in this history. The colonial era transformed Uganda into a cotton factory for the British, a virtual slave state, while fostering the growth of a local oligarchy for the privileged few who ran the plantations. 
Uganda did not gain independence from British imperialism until 1962. This brought to power a key post-independence political figure named Milton Obote, who declared the nation would adopt a version of socialism and nationalized its resources. He also ruffled some feathers by withdrawing support from Israel's proxy war in Sudan, which Israel was training Ugandan police and rebels to fight in. So in 1971, the Israeli government helped plan and execute a military coup against Obote, with armored vehicles and Israeli troops to lock down the new government. Obote would return to power in 1980, but claims the election was rigged sparked a long civil war led by General Museveni. Within a year of seizing power, Museveni signed an agreement with the International Monetary Fund, which implemented sweeping austerity. At the same time, he went to Washington to meet with President Reagan. I'm aware of uh, Mr. Gaddafi's approaches and efforts to get a foothold in your part of Africa and all, and I just, I'd like to intervene in caution. I don't think he has worthy causes either that he is, he is promoting. I think he has a, a kind of world revolutionary idea. I, I started fighting with Gaddafi before you started. <laughs> in 1979. Yes. So this was way before you started well, fighting with Gaddafi. I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> This began an era of Uganda serving as the most important military partner in U.S. operations in neighboring Rwanda, Somalia, Sudan, and the Congo. And ever since, for nearly 40 years, General Museveni has been the sole ruler of the country. That entire time, he's been a staunch ally of the U.S. empire, receiving hundreds of millions of U.S. taxpayer dollars every year. Today, that number is around one billion annually. While Uganda officially holds elections, they're widely recognized as a sham process, dominated by state threats, fraud, and extreme violence. For example, in the 2016 election, they simply arrested the opposition candidate, attacked any campaign rallies, prevented opposition areas from voting, and top Museveni officials told opponents, we will quote, kill your children for protesting. In 2020, Museveni faced his most significant challenger yet, and in turn had to use the most severe repression. Bobby Wine, the 39-year-old pop star, launched a bid for president, running on the platform of ending the government's repression. Wine captured massive support from the huge population of Ugandan youth, who, like Wine, have lived their entire lives under Museveni's rule. So how did this U.S.-backed government respond to this potential election defeat? Well, in the months leading up to the election, they carried out mass kidnappings, where unmarked vans abducted and disappeared around 300 opposition activists, inflicting sheer terror on the population. They also arrested Bobby Wine so he couldn't campaign at all, and used the police to attack his campaign events. When his supporters protested demanding his release, they were executed. No sooner had he stepped up to speak than tear gas and bullets started flying. It was in this pre-election crackdown that Ugandan forces opened fire on unarmed demonstrators killing at least 54 with American training and firepower. There was a violent crackdown on journalists trying to report on the carnage. Sam, another journalist from CTFM in Jinja, was also arrested in the scuffle. With the situation spiraling out of control, the government shut down the internet and social media in the entire country for the week leading up to the election. On January 14th, 2021, 
Museveni claimed a victory with 58% of the vote in a clearly rigged election. Washington accepted the results as legitimate. Now, Biden's administration seems to acknowledge that this friendship doesn't look too good. I believe we said this before, but it probably bears reiterating that Uganda's January 14th elections uh, were marred by election irregularities and abuses by the government's uh, security services against opposition candidates and members of civil society. Uh, we strongly urge independent, credible, impartial, and thorough investigations uh, into these incidents. Uh, we'll consider a range of targeted options uh, to hold accountable uh, those members of the security uh, force is responsible um, for uh, these actions. Okay, easy to condemn random security forces, but what about their man in charge, Museveni himself? When it comes to um, President Museveni, um, Uganda, uh, of course, does continue to play uh, a regional role um, and does have um, an important role when it comes to some of our uh, interests uh, in the region. Well, there you go. So what are those interests that the U.S. finds so important? Well, we know that the U.S. is building its forces across the African continent, swarming it from coast to coast with bases and troops under the openly imperialist U.S. Africa Command. But the U.S. can't dominate Africa alone. Just like the U.S. needs loyal clients like Israel and Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, it needs loyal clients in Africa too. Uganda has been one of those key client states that can act on behalf of U.S. imperialism instead of the U.S. having to send its own military. For example, Uganda is a key base of support for corporate control of the Congo, among the most coveted countries in Africa for its mountain of resources. Also, remember when four-star General Wesley Clark revealed this 2006 Pentagon plan? He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're gonna take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. Well, two of those seven countries are Uganda's neighbors, and both saw Uganda lead the charge for U.S. intervention. First in Somalia, where Uganda invaded in 2007 under U.S. command, and second in Sudan, where Uganda played a major role in the U.S. desired division of the nation into two separate countries. That's how South Sudan was created in 2011, home to 70% of Sudan's oil. But Uganda has also proved its loyalty to the U.S. empire outside of Africa too. Like, you probably didn't know that Uganda sent around 10,000 soldiers to Iraq in 2006 to help the U.S. fight and occupy the country. U.S. military forces routinely operate in Uganda for training, military exercises, and joint combat operations under the U.S.-led African Rapid Response Partnership. Of course, aside from its military role, Uganda is ripe for U.S. capitalism. One of the biggest banks in Uganda is Wall Street's Citibank. In fact, the U.S. State Department issues a guide for doing business in Uganda every year. And the verdict is, it's pretty great. A recent report stated, quote, Uganda maintains a liberal trade and foreign exchange regime and largely adheres to IMF World Bank programs, a free market economy with few limits on foreign investment and abundant resources. Untapped oil and mineral reserves make it a rich nation, yet Uganda is one of the planet's poorest countries in terms of wealth distribution. Museveni has consistently supported the geopolitical goals of the U.S., and for that, he finds himself spared the fate of uncooperative leaders guilty of far less. While the Ugandan people continue to struggle against severe repression and another fraudulent election, for now, the country remains a hallmark example of American hypocrisy, exposing the myth that allies and enemies are based on democracy and human rights. It's not like the U.S. can't make demands on human rights that twist the arm of Museveni. Like in 2014, when Museveni made being gay a crime punishable by life in prison, far too embarrassing for a liberal guy like Obama. So Obama cut all aid. And after that, the law went away pretty quickly. So why doesn't Biden do something similar? Well, because they simply don't care. And apparently a massacre of protesters isn't a big enough scandal for Washington to feel the heat. Not that the U.S. should be dictating human rights in Uganda, 
But what they should definitely not be doing is sponsoring this system of state repression. The best thing for progressive forces in Uganda is an end to U.S. political, financial, and military support for the regime.